Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. Hello everyone. Today we are going to look at the topic of controllers. And this in some sense the reason why I have written taking action over here is because controllers are all about actions, about responding to something that the user has requested, making changes if necessary on the model side, but finally also changing make, uh, making changes on the view that the user sees. So before we get into this, this is potentially a slightly controversial topic and the reason is because if you search online for MVC and you know especially in the context of something like Flask, you will see any number of people sort of vehemently objecting to even calling Flask an MVC framework <coughs> and pretty much any definition of MVC that you come across, you are likely to find people finding some fault with it. Okay. So what I am going to do is take a slight detour into the origins of the MVC concept just to sort of set context over here and then I will sort of go further and explain how I plan to use the con concept of the controller right? and in what sense we are really using the MVC concept over here. And the main thing that I want you to take away from this set of lectures on the controller part of the application development <coughs> is that it is more a way of thought rather than one specific way of doing things. Okay? So with that in mind, let us get into the origins of MVC. Now MVC stands for Model View Controller. It is, it can be thought of as either a design pattern, as I had mentioned earlier, a design pattern is essentially something which over years of experience in implementing certain kinds of designs, people have come up with as a nice consistent way of implementing certain kinds of logic. <clears throat> On the other hand, MVC involves at least three concepts that we can see in the title itself. And there are a number of cases where you would actually see this referred to as a collection of design patterns rather than a single design pattern in itself. right? And there are various names given to the patterns. Now, for somebody who wants to go deep into the uh, study of software engineering, those make a lot of sense because ultimately the reason why we study these things is they help us to better understand where we came from and more importantly, what to do next. Right? So that is the reason for trying to sort of systematize the study of these kind of topics, right? It is not just that people are, you know, do not have anything better to do than give it names. Giving it these names helps us to understand what is special about it and therefore what parts of it are good and should be taken forward versus what parts of it are probably best left behind for the particular context in which you are working. Now, one important thing to understand in this discussion of MVC is that it was originally introduced in the context of GUI design or GUI design, graphical user interface design in the Smalltalk 80 programming language, right? So Smalltalk 80 as the name suggests was somewhere around 1980 it was developed and it was a heavily object oriented language meaning that the whole concept of objects was built into the language right from the start and because of that there were certain ways of thinking about the various parts of programs that lent themselves naturally to the context of that language. <coughs> in particular, so this is what the Wikipedia uh, page for MVC has as a picture. You have the model and the model basically updates the view which is what the user sees. Now the user might want to change the view, might want to look at something else and to do that they cannot directly go back and change the view. They need to use a controller which will go back either request data or manipulate in some ways the model and get back to you with a view. right? So this is the loop that essentially happens over here. So as you can see over here all of this is completely centered around the user and it is about user interface design. right? And what we are talking about is the fact that the user should not directly manipulate the data. In other words, the user to model, there is no connection. I can't go in and directly make changes in the database. I have to use a controller, which means that the kind of changes I can make are automatically constrained. right? And in turn, the model will then determine what the user gets to see by means of controlling the view. Okay? Now the problem with this approach, although it looks simple on the face of it, is that there are many different variants and many different interpretations of this idea. <clears throat> so what I am going to very briefly do is just put up you know, a couple of slides over here 
which are literally from the person who is credited with having come up with this idea in the first place, right? Trigve Reinskog. He was working at the Xerox uh, Palo Alto Research Center uh, during the time that Smalltalk AT was being developed. And this was part of the work that he came up with over there. And these, what I have put up over here, are just snippets from an internal note. Essentially, it's sort of an email that he sent to other people in the group over there, which sort of described his way of systematically structuring different components of a GUI kind of system, right? And if you look at it, it's worth sort of reading. It's a very short note, just like one and a half pages, right? <clears throat> so, from that point of view, what he is saying is, the models represent knowledge, right? It could be either about a single object or it could be some structure of objects. Okay, now that's like sufficiently vague and general, but it also gives you an idea of what is happening. It essentially encapsulates information about an object. In the example that we were looking at earlier, you know, that could be details about a student or it could be structure of objects. You have students, courses, and the connections between them, right? All of those are captured as either a model or multiple models that interact with each other. The view is a visual representation of the model, right? And the important thing to notice over here is this. It is acting as a presentation filter, right? So what presentation filter in this case means is that the database contains data just as, you know, large blobs of binary information, right? And obviously, that's not how you want to look at it. You would rather look at it in a way that the human being can understand, right? So that's a presentation filter. It shows you the information that you need in the present context so that you can make sense of it and make something useful out of it, right? And there are a few more things over here that, you know, it's it would be a good idea to sort of, you know, look up this paper and read through it. It's available, in fact, on his website. Um, it's not that it's too much detail. As I said, it's a very short note, but it sort of gives you an idea of what was the thought process that went into defining the model view controller idea when it started out, right? Remember, this was 40 plus years ago, okay? Now, the important things as far as we are concerned is that the view is attached to the model. It gets the data necessary for the presentation from the model by asking questions, right? So, so you would remember, remember that, that in a previous lecture, we had looked at essentially models and how we can query using SQL, the structured query language. We can query information. Query basically means asking questions, right? So the queries are used in order to gather data about the model, which is then presented to the user in the form of a view, okay? Now, it may also update the model by sending appropriate messages, okay? And this is an important thing to keep in mind. This, in fact, is one of the core ideas of object orientation, right? So object orientation is not so much about classes and inheritance and polymorphism, also, although that's you know, what we normally think of. The most fundamental core idea of object orientation is the fact that there are models of objects that then you can communicate with by sending appropriate messages, right? That encapsulation and the fact that everything, any modification to the object or getting data out of it happens through the process of these messages is at the heart of object orientation, right? So you can see that so far at least the model and view put together are very clearly they have their roots in object oriented programming, right? So this much is reasonably simple and easy to understand. The tricky part then comes what is the control, right? And this is slightly less clearly defined as you can see it's also a longer description right but more importantly it also starts falling apart later in our context right we'll get to that in a little bit later but right now the original definition at least said it's the link between a user and the system okay now what is the view the view is what the user gets out of the system okay but the controller in some sense is the other part of the story Right? It provides the user with input. Now look at this. Now suddenly we have turned things around. Right? The way that this is describing it is that the controller is providing the user with input. Normally when we say input, we are always talking about input to a computer. This is turning things around and saying the computer is generating output, which is input to the user. Okay? So the controller in some sense provides input to the user by arranging for relevant views to present themselves. What does that mean? It means that the controller finally decides what gets displayed on screen, right? 
Not just that, in appropriate places on the screen, it could be, for example, things like a menu bar or a toolbar or some button that needs to be pressed. Okay, that's what we mean when we say that uh, we are arranging for relevant views to present themselves in appropriate places on the screen. Okay, now the second part is that the controller receives such user output. See, once again, it's been turned around so that the user is now generating output. Okay, which becomes input to the system. What the controller does is it receives that, translates it into appropriate messages. Remember, you can only communicate to the model through messages and then passes them to the model and eventually back to the views. Okay, so the controller in some sense is very closely tied with the view because it's deciding what views to present to the user, but is also making sure that the user is never directly interfacing with the model. It takes care of that communication in between. There are a couple of other interesting things to note over here. One of them is a controller should never supplement the views. Right? What that means is if a view has been defined in a certain way, all that the controller can decide is what are the values of various things on the view. It cannot, for example, add anything new. It cannot construct a new view on the fly. It should not, at least. Okay? We want to keep that separation of concerns. Right? That word separation of concerns is something that I have mentioned earlier and I'm going to be repeating multiple times today. And the other interesting thing over here is the view should never know about user input such as mouse operations and keystrokes. Okay, what exactly does that mean? It means that in the view, you should not, for example, hard code in something that says if this button was pressed or if this key was typed in. Okay, all that is handled by the controller. So there is something whenever you are binding a mouse click or a key press to an action. You are binding it to an action, not a view. Right? The action essentially is what we are thinking of as the controller. Okay? So please keep that in mind. At the end of the day, what we are trying very rigorously as far as possible to do over here is to separate out the model, which only stores data, the view, which shows data to the user, and the controller, which actually takes care of action. Right? And how do we sort of go about implementing that kind of action is what this entire set of lectures is going to be about. So the general concept that we are talking about is there has to be an action, right, which is taken, uh, which basically takes user input, does something and most likely modifies the model or may not modify, it may only read data from the model without modifying it and finally gives it back to the view. It communicates with the model, extracts the view and then finally brings it back to the user, okay. So that kind of action is what we mean by controller. However, when we get sort of deeper into this, we'll realize that there are sort of slightly more nuanced meanings given to that term controller that we should probably think about a little bit more. So let's think about the applicability, right? The MVC model was originally designed for GUI applications, right? <clears throat> and the main idea, as I said, was the separation of concerns. We have a model we have a view and they are connected through a controller, right? And what happens in a typical GUI application, let us say running on your Windows laptop or on a Linux desktop or laptop is that there is some concept of the state of the interaction. After all, whatever is being displayed on the screen is being done by a program which knows exactly what is there and you know what you are likely to click on and there are certain limits on what you can do at that point in time, right? So in other words, there is some concept of a state that the overall system is in, right? And the MVC model was built around that. That concept, the fact that there is a state which is determined by the underlying system and that the controller, you know, there are limitations on what you can do and therefore the controller can directly be the link between the view and the model, right, is what got implemented in the MVC structure. Now, when we come to the web, things change a little bit. Right. One major change is that the server and the client are now in most cases of interest at least on different machines, okay. which means that in general the server cannot know the state of the client because in between the server having sent one response to the client and the next request coming from the client, the client may have rebooted, the client may have moved to a different place and picked up a different IP address. Right? The client may have gone into a low power mode, lots of other things could have happened which the server knows nothing about. That is not the case in 
a typical desktop GUI application, but is very often the case on the web, or at least has to be the default state that we assume that the server cannot know the state of the client. The client in turn is purely a front end to the user. It's pretty much just a browser, right? You're looking at it and saying, okay, you know, this is what this I'm seeing in front of me. This is how I need to interact with it. Because of this, many of the analogies that are used in order to understand MVC break down, right? And hence we come up with any number of different variants that are used to understand how MVC is applied. And you will in fact come across you know, a whole lot of comments on Stack Overflow and various other places which say that this is not MVC or that is not MVC or how could you possibly describe something like this as MVC. And in fact, I would not be surprised if some of you right now are going to look through this entire series of lectures and say, but what you have described is not MVC, quite possibly, right? What I am trying to convey over here is that there is a frame of mind or rather a thought process involved in MVC, the separation of concerns that I am repeatedly stressing on that is useful from the point of view of designing an application, right? Whether you choose to call that MVC at the end or some other model may determine how you go about designing your system, right? But at the end of the day, what you need to keep in mind is that you should try and have as clear as possible a uh, architecture of your application which separates out the different parts that need to be implemented. Okay, and that is what MVC ultimately is trying to do. So, like I said, MVC is a good conceptual framework, right? But it breaks down if it's applied too rigidly. So, beware of that. Do not try and say, okay, is this MVC or is this not MVC? That's not a useful question to ask in general. Okay. Part of the reason for that is, especially in the context of web apps, they do not have the close-knit structure of GUI applications, the server and client sort of being on the same system and therefore the server knowing what state the client is in and so on, right? There are also a few other things. So, for example, you will find that ASP, the programming language from, well, the ASP.NET from Microsoft, right, actually has a lot of, I mean, they have tried to stick to the MVC concept quite closely, okay? But what happens there is they also sort of take it further and in fact infer some information from model types that are directly influence certain views and certain controller architectures and so on, right? So there is this concept of the type of the underlying object which can be used in a language like C Sharp, which is used for ASP.NET, which does not really exist in Python, right? So Python does not have a concept of static data types, that is to say data types that are declared up front before the program starts running, okay? And because of that, there is a lot of type inference and things that happen in Python which tends to break some of those ideas from ASP.NET MVC when you try applying them in a Python-like framework. Now, why are we still choosing to use Python? Because it's a relatively easy language to program and develop in, right? And even though I said that there are certain issues such as static typing and so on, as long as you understand that MVC is more of a conceptual framework and not something to rigidly stick to, you should still be able to benefit from the ideas, right? So apply the basic learnings from the MVC model, but be prepared to stretch them in different ways.